uh, Riaz Fazulaboy, as, uh, as, as well as Andy Clemenko, uh, here to walk through uh, secure substrate and least privilege container deployments. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to our talk, uh, Secure Substrate, Least Privileged Container Deployment. I think the slides haven't been updated yet. There we go. Uh, I'm Riaz, I'm from the security team at Docker. Andy Klemenko, Solutions Architect. And we'll get started. So as you saw from all the talks this morning and throughout the day. Uh, with Docker, it's very easy with a single command to deploy your application with multiple services, uh, secrets, networks, and volumes. And what this talk is about really is even though this one command is easy, it doesn't mean that it's simple to make everything secure under the hood. So in this talk, we're going to look at all the pieces that have to come together that are necessary to do this deploy securely. And as an analogy for infrastructure security, I'd like to use one of my favorite games, uh, Tetris. And Tetris is a simple game in which you have a group of pieces with different shapes and colors. They're called tetrominoes. And you have to align them in a way that makes complete rows. And this is very similar to infrastructure security because in Tetris, when you leave holes, you're having a bad game. And with infrastructure security, leaving holes are like having vulnerabilities, the largest, larger attack service area. So in this talk, we're going to describe all the different pieces which we consider our, our own tetrominoes and how we construct them in secure ways. So as you can see, we've got a whole bunch of pieces that make up our tetrominoes. Uh, we're going to start with InfraKit, Run C, ContainerD. We're going to go into detail on some of these in a minute. Docker, Notary, SwarmKit, and l not least, but latest added, is Linux Kit. Cool. So our first security tetromino is InfraKit, which provides infrastructure-independent machine management. What this means is that across all platforms, your favorite cloud, or locally, you can use InfraKit to provision and update your infrastructure. And the way that InfraKit does this is using declarative updates. So with a simple InfraKit group commit command, you specify what kind of machines you want, how many machines, what kind of health checks you have, and with a single command, InfraKit will just make it so in a declarative update. And from a security perspective, this is really important to enable something we'd like to coin reverse uptime. So many of you are probably familiar with the notion of uptime, where you count up from zero how long a machine has been alive for, and many people use it as a sign of health. But with reverse uptime, where instead of counting up, you count down from a certain amount of time that a machine should ever be allowed to live for. So in this sense, 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, we'd want to actually reprovision our machine with a new golden OS image. And this is really important for three reasons. So Firstly, machines living for a long host of time uh, are prone to OS drift, where your configuration may slightly change as the application is running, and this could lead to unexpected downtime in your infrastructure. So redeploying with a new golden OS image ensures that all your machines are in sync. Uh, second, you want to make sure that your kernel is always up to date, because with the new bump, uh, patches to kernels, you have security patches, as well as new features in the kernel set uh, that your infrastructure can benefit from. And lastly, by using reverse uptime to constantly refresh your OS images, you're removing any persistence if an attacker has found a back door in your infrastructure. So by redeploying with a new golden OS image, you're removing persistence from your OSs and making the attacker's job much more difficult to exploit that back door over and over again or pivot in your infrastructure. And InfraKit makes this very simple to do with rolling deploys. So with InfraKit, you could uh, <clears throat> configure it to kill an OS that's been running in your infrastructure past its reverse uptime <laughs> allowed and reprovision a brand new golden OS image in your infrastructure in a rolling fashion so that you don't have any interruptions in service. 
And now that we've introduced InfraKit to provision an OS, we can use Linux Kit, which is our newest addition to Tetrominos, which we open sourced just a couple of week ago, weeks ago at DockerCon to, as the most secure OS builder to run your containers on in your infrastructure. So at the core of Linux Kit uh, is a minimal base. So Linux Kit, its sole purpose is to run containers and be secure. And so in doing just those two things, we only need a very minimal kernel in user space. Uh, and that kernel, we ensure that we use a modern kernel so that we can actually leverage the latest security features such as extended Berkeley packet filters. And, and as well, we were collaborating with the Kernel Self-Protection Project, or, which are uh, a group of folks who are aiming to upstream important kernel security improvements. And we have members on the team at Docker also contributing to the Kernel Self-Protection Project to namespace IMA, if you're familiar with integrity measurement architecture, uh, and as well as to harden uh, extended Berkeley packet filters. So that's the kernel side. On the user space and build chain side, we've actually borrowed a lot of the great work from Alpine, uh, which has hardened compilers. So for example, the GCC compiler comes with a slew of hardened stack protector flags by default. Uh, and as well, we use Alpine uh, to get some of our user space uh, tools, such as DHCP, which actually run in containers in Linux kit. So they're configured to drop privilege and run with minimal capability. And on top of that minimal base, that base is actually read-only. Um, the file system is read-only, and so Linux Kit helps you build immutable infrastructure. Uh, for an attacker, this means if they are somehow able to compromise Linux, your Linux Kit-based OS, they can't go in and edit important configs or overwrite important uh, executables in your system. So this removes a large amount of the attack surface area in your Linux Kit built OS. And while we announced Linux Kit at Docker only a couple weeks ago, if you've been using Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, Docker for AWS, Azure, GCP, you've actually been using Linux Kit based OS under the hood. Um, and so at Docker as well, we've been using Linux Kit based OSs in production, and we learned many lessons from using Linux Kit across all of our additions uh, as well as internally. Looking ahead, we want Linux Kit to be a place for new kernel security projects to have a home. Uh, and so to that end, in the Linux Kit repo, uh, we have some initial integration work with uh, a number of projects. So a few I'd like to highlight are the Landlock Linux security module, which makes use of that new kernel extended Berkeley packet filter feature to provide very fine-grained access control, which is perfect for containers, and as well as WireGuard, which is a modern, fast B VPN um, that can revolutionize container and host networking. And we've also been working with a number of partners on some very exciting projects, such as splitting the kernel into inner and outer kernel components. Uh, one thrust within Linux Kit for future facing security uh, that I'd like to highlight is one goal of the project is to rewrite as many of the system daemons in type safe languages. And this is really important to remove classes of attacks of type safety and memory safety uh, from the base OS. And so I placed OCAM on the slide here because today in the Linux Kit repo, we've actually implemented a unikernel based, uh, written in OCaml, implemented with Mirage OS, which is a unikernel builder, uh, version of GHCP. And so it's functional. You can play with it today and include it in your own Linux Kit based OS. And we want to work with the community. Uh, to write more such type safe daemons in Rust, OCaml, or a type safe language of your choice. So that kind of brings us to some of the higher level components like Run C. Run C is going to be your lightweight execution of your containers. It's a base fundamental component, and we donated it to, East, uh, to OCI a while back. What, OCI, what Run C is going to bring is namespace isolation in C, which really this is what executes your container. Right. Again, this is another one of our tetronomos. We're going to move up a little bit in the stack and go to container D. This is going to super. This is going to be the supervisor of all of your run C. Uh, this really is another good building block in terms of orchestrating at a, on a single node. Let's go on. Container D allows you to do content addressable pools. So I'm going to let you know on a secret. A Docker tag is actually a pointer to a hash. 
right? So this allows you, I know it's a big secret, <laughs> but once you start to realize that, you're actually, when you, when you reference a tag, you're actually referencing a hash. We can do, container D can actually pull those hashes specifically, right? So this allows you to be very specific as to what image you want to pull. And the other cool part about this hash is it uses Merkle DAG to hash tree to sum up essentially all the other layer hashes, right? So you get, basically you get a guarantee that when you pull that hash, you're getting all of the layers as well and getting a guarantee, which is pretty cool. This kind of starts to build out secure by default. Move on. One of the other cool things that we do is with, with the Docker uh, project, the Docker component, is we can apply additional security around it, right? So we can use SC Linux App Armor. We have roughly, what is it, roughly 40 whitelist, cap 40 capabilities within the kernel, and we whitelist only 12 of them for containers. So right now you're getting a subset of the full kernel capability. So even just containerizing your existing app today, you get to take advantage of a much smaller surface area. And unfortunately, I gotta use a term that Nathan used earlier, you're reducing the blast radius. Sorry, that's a good one, how to use it. <laughs> um, on top of that, there's also syscall whitelists with seccomp, right? So again, much smaller surface area, much smaller blast radius, out of the box without even thinking about it, right? Really important. We can now, now that we've got our images, we've, we've already, I've already told you the secret that the tag points to a hash, but now we can actually use notary to kind of cryptographically sign that hash, right, to ensure that what you're pulling is exactly what you wanted, right? So this kind of sets, notary is an important piece for setting up that supply chain, or it's an important piece in the supply chain. With notary, you get cryptographic name resolution, right? So again, here's a, if you look at the slide, it's a really good example of the tag points to a hash, right? And we already talked about the, the Merkle DAG being the sum of the hashes, right? So now we have a way to ensure exactly what you want is exactly what you want, as well as some of the parts. I'm simplifying a little bit, but I think it, it fits. One other thing we can also do is we can have multiple signatures. So what we advocate is threshold signing. So let's say you want to have the developer sign off on it. That that's the image that he produced or Jenkins through a CI pipeline. So Jenkins or the developer would sign. But then you want to pass it through a QA process. You can have QA sign off on it, right? So now you've got an additional signature. So you can see with threshold signing is as the image passes these thresholds, it can obtain additional signatures. Right? Again, I'm sure most of you guys remember trust but verify. This is a way you can verify that each stage was met correctly. Um, uh, another cool feature is uh, survivable key compromise. So we have the ability to rotate keys within Notary. So if it was compromised, you can essentially revoke the old, issue, uh, re-sign the image with a new key, and you can keep going, which is pretty cool. Which brings us to our last Atromino, SwarmKit. So all the Atromino's so far we've talked about uh, are often thought about in the context of a single host, a single node. But what if you want to run a cluster with dozens or thousands of nodes? So this is the goal of SwarmKit, which is our least privileged container orchestrator. Uh, security in SwarmKit starts with node introduction, when you want to add a node to your swarm. Um, and to join a swarm, you must provide a valid join token. So this is an example of such a token. And that token is split up into four important parts. Uh, firstly, we have a known prefix to the token. Uh, this is so that if, by accident, you've accidentally committed the token to GitHub or it ends up in your backup logs, you have an easy grep command for Swarm token and know when to rotate your tokens out. And Swarm will let you rotate the, the tokens. Uh, our second part of the token is a token version, which is self-explanatory, still on version one. And the next two parts kind of get more interesting. So the third component is the hash of a root CA. Uh, each swarm provides a root CA. And so we're actually pinning the root CA here so that we don't have to do trust on first use or tofu. So many of you might be familiar with SSH. When you SSH into a node for the first time, you get that scary message of do you trust this thing? And that's basically trust on first use asking you, do you want to trust this on first use? 
So with Swarm, we've actually, by pinning the hash of the root CA into the token, you eliminate having to go through trust on first use and can trust immediately using pinning that hash. And the last part of our token is a random secret, but it's actually a proof of authorization to join the Swarm with a specific role. In SwarmKit, we have two roles, administrative manager nodes, which have more privilege, and lesser privilege worker nodes, which can take containers and run workloads. And so using this join token, upon successful joining of the Swarm, each node is issued cryptographic node identity in the form of an X509 certificate. In this certificate, we have a number of fields to have highlighted uh, that are particularly important to the Swarm. So firstly, uh, in the CN, we have a randomly generated node ID, which is used to uniquely identify each node in the Swarm. We have the node role, uh, which corresponds to what role, a value we had in the token for whether we could join as a manager or worker. Here we have a manager. And lastly, we have the ID of the Swarm itself. Um, and these certs um, provide our graphic node identity, but they're also constantly being rotated within the Swarm so that you can even bring it down to a one hour rotation time for these certificates so that if you accidentally lose a cert in backups or some other way it gets leaked, uh, the average lifetime of the certificate for an attacker to use is only 30 minutes. And so building on top of our node identity and certs, we can actually use mutual, uh, mutually authenticated TLS uh, using those certs to provide encrypted, authenticated, and authorized communications across the control plane of the entire swarm. And so what this means is that you not only have encrypted data going across the swarm, but the certificates, since they have the node identity signed into the cert, uh, we can use that for authorization. So a manager knows it's talking to a worker, but likewise, a worker can never pretend to be a manager because it doesn't have the identity in its in the certificate, nor can it forge it. And likewise, managers know when they're talking to managers in the swarm. And building on top of mutual TLS, we now have ways to increase the security of your applications. And one really important feature of SwarmKit is secure secret distribution. Uh, so building on top of the encrypted, authenticated, authorized communications, uh, we can only send secrets to the nodes that need it. So in this example, only the red container worker will ever get the red key. It will never get the, the black secret. Um, and these secrets are exposed as a file so that any framework or language you desire can actually consume the secret, but it's only kept in memory so that the secret is never written to disk and that once the container that needs the secret is done running, you can delete the secret from the swarm, from the node. So least privileged secret distribution, the secret is only distributed to the node that needs it and deleted when it's done. And lastly, one of the newest features of SwarmKit that I'd like to highlight today uh, that really, I think, sets it apart is transparent root rotation. Um, I mentioned that SwarmKit has a root CA, uh, which is our root of trust uh, for our mutual TLS in the system. And many other security frameworks and products also rely on such a, a root of trust. Um, but many of these projects, uh, you can ask you know, security engineers, other folks, you say, okay, what happens if that root of trust is compromised? And most folks will give you uh, shrug. And so for us in SwarmKit, we realized we had an opportunity to, to do better. And so that's what transparent rotation allows us to do. It allows us to rotate the root of trust. And it happens in four easy steps. So first, you decide that for whatever reason, you maybe uh, you just feel like it, or you have a suspicion that you need to rotate your root of trust, that you like to rotate. Uh, you previously trusted the blue lock, uh, the blue CA we'll call, uh, and now add a new CA in red. And so the manager node issues certs for the managers and uh, tr now trusts both the blue and red CA. The manager nodes then force the worker nodes to rotate, to trust both the blue and red CAs. And finally, once all nodes in the swarm trust both, and you're confident that you can switch over trust, the manager node then instructs the nodes to remove trust in the blue node and transparently rotate over to the red CA. And that is transparent rotation. Well, let's bring it all together. We've got notary, 
with Docker, right, for image name resolution. Yeah, that's right. We got cryptographic pools, cryptographically verified image pools, right, so we know what the image is. Oh, these animations are fun. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, we can use notary for secure dependency resolution. This will make sense in a sec, trust me. So if we can actually build on some of these tetronomos and put them together, right, with Linux Kit, uh, one of the things we didn't kind of divulge is that Linux Kit actually has a run C daemon, run C, to deploy a Docker daemon, right? We can bring in system level capability, like DHCP, NTP, things like that, cryptographically signed, right? So we're, at, we're now able to extend Notary to verify operating system level components, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a unique thing that, that I don't think is, anyone's doing in the industry. And like, like Raya spoke to earlier, is we can build these pretty quickly with Linux Kit. So the idea is you're constantly building, right, through a CI pipeline, your, your operating system. It really becomes immutable, and you're cryptographically verifying all the components going into it. I think it's amazingly unique. Cool. What if we use SwarmKit to work with Docker and deliver containers? Well, you get authorized, authenticated, encrypted delivery of all the resources via mutual TLS, which means that, yes, for secrets, we discussed they're encrypted, but also for configurations. So StormKit can provide those, which means that any man in the middle snooping in on your traffic will see nothing. So what if we also combine InfraKit with StormKit to, to bootstrap our clusters when we want to add nodes? Well, we can use the join tokens that we discussed earlier and kick off secure node cluster introductions. So it happens in three steps. First step is using our token to verify we download the root CA material from the manager nodes in our SwarmKit uh, cluster, and we use the pinned hash from that third part of the token to verify that the public key material is correct. We then submit a CSR, a uh, certificate signing request, with our secret token uh, to the manager, asking if we can get a certificate, getting our node identity. And if all goes well, we receive the signed certificate with our cryptographic node identity and join the swarm and talk mutual TLS across all nodes in the swarm. So building on top of that, if we need an OS to run on with Docker, what if we use Linux Kit? Well, as Andy mentioned, since Linux Kit pulls in containers and runs containers as its system daemons, we actually get a hardened configuration for Docker that we can customize, but also a least privileged uh, configuration where we can drop capabilities utilize namespaces and C groups to restrict Docker to only the privilege it needs on our Linux kit based OS. And now that we have an OS that we are happy with to run Docker, what if we use InfraKit and Notary together to get a trusted OS provisioning mechanism for this OS? Well, we can leverage a fairly recent Linux kernel technology known as DM Verity, which provides integrity over the block level uh, state of the OS in the form of a Merkle tree where each block chains up and hashes up to a single root hash. So we can enable that on Linux kit based OS, but then we have to get some way of getting that hash in the first place. So we can use InfraKit, which provisions infrastructure to provide that hash. But then you may be wondering, okay, how does InfraKit get that hash in a secure way? Well, we can use Notary, which provides cryptographic name resolution to securely provide that hash, and along with all the signing guarantees it provides for that translation, to provide to InfraKit, to provide to the Linux Kit-based OS when provisioning our infrastructure. So now you can kind of see we've got InfraKit. Now we can start layering in run C, containerd in the Docker runtimes to provide workflow, right? Your applications that you want to run. What we're essentially creating is a secure by default container execution environment, right? We can go further. What if we add in Notary and SwarmKit? What does this get you? Secure by default container platform, right? Because now with SwarmKit, we can cluster these things. We can go even further, which is great. We can add Linux Kit, Notary, InfraKit, all these together. And now we're, we're really going immutable from the ground up. Secure by default infrastructure. 
So you can kind of see how we can stack all these tetronomos together, all these pieces together, and really build out a secure solution. Cool. And I'll now like to show you a demo Wait. of. Wait. Uh, doesn't this thing? No. Nope. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the slide. Oh, sorry. It's uh, on another screen. I will show you a demo of. Cool. Of all the pieces coming together. <clears throat> so, on my right terminal, let me get my mouse over there. Over here, I have a swarm of one, so a swarm kit cluster of one node. This is a manager. It's running on a Linux kit based OS, and I'm using InfraKit to uh, declaratively uh, basically uh, configure my infrastructure. And so what I will show you now is we're going to show a stack deploy, but first I want to add a node uh, that's going to be baked, uh, based on Linux kit OS, added with InfraKit, uh, using some of the combinations we saw of all the tetrominoes coming together, and finally securely deploy a stack. So here is my worker to be. I have a configuration for my Linux kit based OS. You can see the kernel is an image, and we have other images in the system. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just build it. And so what you see here is I'm building my Linux kit-based OS. Each of these lines is an image that is pulled with notary verification. So each of these lines, I'm actually doing signature verification against the image. And then finally, the Mobi tool will output uh, uh, an OS, basically in the form of a nitrid and BZ image. So let me just show you. There are my outputs. Uh, in this swarm.json file, I have basically a declaration of my swarm cluster. And at the top, I have this ID of swarm workers, and right now it's zero in size. So I'd like to add a node, which would be my worker node. So I'm going to set this to one. And infrakit group commit swarm.json. So what I'm going to do now is I already have a manager. I want to add my worker. So a simple command, group commit swarm.json is now managing two instances. And now I'd like to show you what's actually happening under the hood. So I'm just going to run. Uh, Worker, or give it a disk first. So this is booting up the, the image I just built. Uh, this is all the boot logs from our modern kernel, uh, which has been configured with all the kernel self-protection project uh, configuration recommendations. And very shortly, we'll start to see a DM Verity coming through. So here's the setup. I have some extra prints so we can see what's happening. Just a second now. So we'll see, this is, for the system, we have this root hash, 18CD, and Notary is giving us the same hash. So pass to Notary, pass to InfraKit, uh, using the cryptographic name translation, and now we have our, our shell, and this is our Linux kit-based OS. And if you remember, we have a read-only file system, so I can't edit anything. And on top of that, Docker is actually running inside a container. So there is my Docker. And where is it? I am part of a swarm with node ID PNZ8. And if I look back at my manager, InfraKit uh, handled our node introduction, and now I have two nodes in my swarm. So now that I've securely bootstrapped my worker node into my swarm, Let's deploy. So I'm just going to do, I have a stack file here, docker stack deploy, YAML, and this is our sample at C app from DockerCon. So here it is, just creating all the services. And on this, we'll start to see some extra debug logs. And we have containers running on both nodes. And we've securely, from the ground up, brought together all of our tetrominos and deployed a stack. So, there you go. And I need to change it back. My mouse. So, in this talk, we showed you 
different tetrominoes that we've been building at Docker, all open source, that can come together in very interesting ways. We showed you InfraKit for machine management and provisioning, Linux Kit for building a secure base OS, RunC, ContainerD, and Docker for secure container execution runtime, Notary for cryptographic name resolution across all parts of the stack, and SwarmKit for secure, least privileged clustering solution. And so when you bring them together to bring declarative updates, reverse uptime, remotely attested OS that runs a secure by default container execution runtime with least privileged orchestration for secure secrets, what do you get? You get a secure substrate, the Moby Whale. Thank you very much.